Quentin Tarantino's filmmaking career will come to an end when he makes The Movie Critic. The iconic director has made nine films. Let's rank them worst to best. What's up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. We're going to try to rank Quentin Tarantino's incredible filmography. This is probably going to be the toughest ranking we've ever done because even his lower tier movies are, it'll be the best movie of another filmmaker's career. That's how incredible he is as a writer and a director. These are movies you grew up with and still watch to this day. And my God, it's tough to rank these. True. I mean, so many people love his filmography and everyone's going to have a different list. Yeah. So we're not going to please everybody. This took us a while to just like go back and forth on. I agreed with Anthony on a lot of it, but also we disagreed quite a bit, but we had to settle for making this list because there's two of us. There's two. So basically it's a democracy. It is uh, kind of. Is it a, well, it's, it's a partnership. Yeah, there's two it's people. Not, it's not exactly democracy. a democracy. <laughs> but it is an impossible list to make and everyone's list is valid in their own opinion because it's subjective. But before we get into this episode, we have huge news, everybody. On February 26th, we will be hosting a private screening of Dune Part 2 in Los Angeles, California with IMAX at their private theater. And we will be giving away tickets to 30 fans of the show. All you have to do to enter this giveaway is send us a direct message on the Raiders of the Lost podcast Instagram with your full name and email address. 30 winners will be selected at random on February 20th to receive two tickets each. This giveaway is for event entry only. Please only enter if you are local to the area or can cover your own travel. Good luck and we'll see you on February 26th. For official rules, see the link in the bio and in the episode description. We have a pretty solid list that we think ranks Tarantino's nine films. So we'll be, we'll be blending Kill Bill Volume 1 and Volume 2 into Kill Bill, The Whole Bloody Affair. So technically that's one movie, even though often we'll talk about that as two separate movies. The separate releases a year apart, but technically it's one whole bloody affair. Yes. So that will count as one. But he's made so many great movies, so in order from his filmography in terms of time... In chronology, he made Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown, Kill Bill Volume 1, Kill Bill Volume 2. Then we go into Django. Death Proof. I mean, Death Proof, then Django. No, no, no. Death Proof, Inglorious Bastards, Django. Mm -hmm. And then he made, hold on, I'm going through my list that's ranked, Hateful Eight, <laughs> and then Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You did it. <laughs> what an absurd filmography, first of all. Several of those are all-time films in general. In oh, American yeah, all-time. Yeah, all-timers. And some of our personal favorite movies ever. Movies that got us into loving film, loving cinema, as well as wanting to pursue filmmaking. A lot of them are on this list, as well as Game Changers, an independent film in the 90s for America with Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. So Tarantino will live on forever as one of the best filmmakers to ever come out of the United States. Oh, and yeah. just the globe in general. And I can't wait for the movie critic and they start filming next year. Hopefully they can have it ready for December or at least in 2025. We'll see. And hopefully the rumors of Tom Cruise circling the project end up coming to fruition and we can see Tom Cruise in a Tarantino movie. Even in a small role. Yeah. Even in just like five lines, if that's something crazy, a cool cameo. Just, just imagine a Quentin Tarantino movie poster with Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise on it. Just imagine that. Absurd. Oh my God. You, if he's a co-lead or the lead. Oh. And I, I often look at him and Paul Thomas Anderson of having of having similar career trajectories. And you can see it in both their early films and then their later films and they showcase what they like to make movies about. So both of them started out with contemporary films, mostly set in LA. So we get Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown. He didn't write Jackie Brown, but still it's set in that time. And then after Kill Bill. He never made a movie set in the present day. He just loves being in a different period now. Since, uh, well, Death Proof also is about is probably contemporary. I would say Death Proof. It feels like it's like the seventies. Okay, it could. It feels Possibly. like yeah. It feels like it could it's, not be though. Yeah, it, it could be. I don't think that I even know what year that takes place in. But it does it doesn't feel like contemporary when it came out? But I could be wrong. But that being said, his last five movies have just been period pieces. Are there cell phones in Death Proof? I haven't seen it in a couple of years. I think so. I think there might be, but we could be wrong. I think it's. I think, I think it's, it's contemporary. I think it's contemporary. But it has a western vibe to it. It has a period yeah. piece vibe to it. But he's just, and with the movie critic, we know it's going to be nineteen seventies again. He's just gravitated towards period pieces. Same thing with Paul Thomas Anderson. Starting out with contemporary L.A. movies, you get Magnolia, you get Heart Eight. Well, that's at Vegas, but still, you know what I mean. And then Boogie Nights is a, okay. Boogie Nights is a period piece. Hold on. 
<laughs> Whoa, what are you even talking about, Magnolia, man? Punch Drunk Love, and <laughs> Heart Eight. So contemporary stuff. Yeah, and, then, yeah. and then after that, Paul Thomas Anderson just stuck with period pieces. That's what he's been doing the last five movies of his. And I'm sure Paul Thomas Anderson will only make period pieces. I feel confident about that. And that's how Tarantino finished up the last half of his year. So they both started in L.A. And they're both from L.A. And then they both gravitated towards, let's get away from contemporary filmmaking. Let's get away from cell phones and technology. And let's do like movies that feel like you're in a different time period. And that's what I, I think that Tarantino truly excels when he's in a different time period. And that's when his writing oftentimes is the best. It's understandable. You know, when you're an independent filmmaker, you don't have a large budget. You got to kind of work with what you got. Yeah. We live in Highland Park. The area that they shot Reservoir Dogs. I, we see the locations all the time. It's so so goddamn cool. Or less than half a mile away from all the spots where where Mr. Orange gets shot in the stomach. We're half a mile away from where Mr. Mr. Pink Mr. ran. Pink, Mr. Pink pulls the lady out of the car and steals the car and gets hit by a car. Like, that's a cafe that I've been to a thousand times. Our it's ATM's crazy. right there. Yeah, it's, it's nuts how close we are to the locations for Reservoir Dogs. So it's, it always reminds me of Tarantino movies. Same thing with Pulp Fiction. It's very much an L.A. movie. But, you know, you got to work with what you got. You yeah. got not even a million dollars to make a movie. you got to figure great it out. Great point. And using the period pieces and the bigger budgets, he gets to create really incredible filmmaking. Like, Django Unchained is one of his most beautiful films. Like, the cinematography in that film from Robert Richardson is absolutely amazing. It might be his best-looking film, I would say, Django Unchained, with the beautiful landscapes, beautiful uh, environments and costume and production design. And then another great one, obviously, is Inglourious Bastards. But there's something about... The cinematography, particularly of Django Unchained, is I think it, it might be his best looking film. Possibly. I always say that Inglorious Bastards is his best looking movie because it, it's just such a great production. I think that's ma- mainly because it has such great locations and sets. Django does as well, but I think the the interiors and the sets for Inglorious Bastards are just exceptional. Yeah. Well, and, well, I mean, he's such a great filmmaker, like Nolan. No CGI, no green screens. If we're going to shoot it, we're going to build it. No matter what period it is, no matter what the actual set is. A little, little, little tiny bit. time in Hollywood. You had to recreate uh, L.A. Yeah, but he's, he, they built Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, I know. They built yeah. that, you know, and the miniature work in that. And so I just really love when the filmmakers who are really at the top of the echelon of directors, they're still holding on to the old school filmmaking techniques of the early days of cinema. And that's really important, I think, going forward because it still looks better than if he had – like CGI Sunset Boulevard to actually build those storefronts and having Brad Pitt really driving on that street with those storefronts and lights and signs really there, it made all the difference in the world and really sucks you into the immersive experience of seeing that film. Keeps your movies timeless. Oh, yeah. A lot of yes. these movies today, the last 10, 15 years, they're not going to feel timeless because the CGI has just been very mediocre compared to even the early 2000s. I mean, Lord of the Rings are going to be timeless and those that CGI still holds up. But mm-hmm. recently, a lot of movies just... Cutting back on the CGI quality, these movies are not going to look the same in 20 years. They're going to look kind of like ass. There's a there's a great example of Baz Luhrmann's Great Gatsby. That movie is basically all CGI. And it looks good. And if you're watching the film in a the theater, you know, you're getting into it. But you can tell it's visual effects. And when they're driving around the cities or whatever... It's all they're just they did that most of that movie in front of blue screens and green screens for yeah. all the exteriors. And it does show. When especially 10 years later, you're like, I mean, the CGI is okay, but it takes you out of it. But you can watch Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Every time you watch it, you're going you're to be like, oh, that's the 1960s of L.A. Like, that's really it. And also, what I really love about his filmmaking and his evolution as a filmmaker is, like you mentioned, the early budgets with his first few films. Then, when he was able to have, like, pretty much any budget he wanted, he was beginning to be more expressive and more freewheeling and more creative with who he was as a filmmaker. Kill Bill was one of the biggest steps in his filmmaking career of, I'm going to put a ton of Ennio Morricone scores in it. I'm going to put Kung Fu in it. I'm going to do these fun camera techniques of all these movies that I adore and grew up watching. I'm going to throw these into these elements into my movies, and they seeped into Kill Bill, and we still get them to this day, uh, especially with, the, I think, The Hateful Eight was a great culmination of all those things with an actual score made by Ennio Morricone for the film. And so getting those elements that he loved in cinema and putting them into Kill Bill really rejuvenated, I think, his creativity and let him really explore how he was as a director. I love how he you can see his inspiration behind specific movies. And you can see, obviously, like the way that Chinese cinema and kung fu inspired Kill Bill in so many different ways. But then a movie like The Thing, how that not only heavily inspired Reservoir Dogs, but also something like Hateful Eight. Hateful Eight, 
kind of is the thing in a lot of in very similar ways. I mean, we're talking about an isolated location during in an Arctic environment, not Arctic, but a, fro a frozen environment, yes. a massive blizzard, even things like ropes hammered into the snow for going to the bathroom. That's in the thing as well. You can see that in one of the shots in the thing. So Kurt it's, Russell being armed the whole time. Yeah, yeah. massive, massive uh, similarities to movies like the thing that you can see in multiple films and just he's just a huge fan of great cinema and he's helping preserve cinema. Who, If you're going to pick your three favorite characters in Tarantino movies, who are your three favorites? Whoa, tough question on the spot, Anthony. Okay, do it, I man. got it. All right, my favorite characters in Tarantino movies, number one, Beatrix Kiddo. Number two, I'm going to go with, oh, what a tough question, my man. <laughs> what a tough question. I will probably say uh, Jules from Pulp Fiction mm -hmm. for number two, and then number three for my favorite characters in Tarantino movies, Rick Dalton from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, great pick. <laughs> good pic God damn it, bitch. Good, good picture. Good picture. <laughs> I'm going to go with Hans Landa for number one. Nice. Then I'm going to go Beatrix Kiddo for number two. And then for number three, I'm going Django. Yeah, I good, love Django. Good pick. And then, I mean, Jules is a close second. Jules I like is the fantastic. way you die, boy. Like the way you die, boy. Man, it's, it's fantastic. And Tarantino has always done it his way. He's never given in to studio demands. He's never let anyone else control him or tell him what he can do or can't do. Even from the beginning with Reservoir Dogs, when he was pitching the script to studios and production companies, he's like, this is it. If you don't want to make it, if you want to make any changes, that's not going to fly. I'll walk. This is my script. I want to make this. If you're on board with that, let's do it. So and also choosing to direct Reservoir Dogs yes. versus True Romance because yeah. True Romance was directed by Tony Scott and both scripts were being shot at the same time. And it's basically like, do you want, I'll direct Reservoir Dogs and he was like, no, I want to direct Reservoir Yeah, Tony Dogs. wanted Reservoir Dogs. You can direct yeah. True Romance. Yeah, so he, I think that he, always sticking to his guns has has been a defining aspect to Tarantino's career of never giving it and always doing it his way. Like someone like Christopher Nolan, just like, this is my film, this is how I'm doing it. That's the way it is. It's great. Yeah, I think he knew he was a genius back then. And, you know, he's a flawed person like most people, but I think he knew how good he was at writing and filmmaking. He knew he had the potential to do a movie like Reservoir Dogs himself. And he he does, I mean, yeah, he's not the most modest person alive, but he'll talk, he'll he'll confirm when he sucks. Like he said, the first movie he ever made that he shot with his friends, he said it was terrible. He's like, I did that, it was awful, but I learned from it, and then I made Reservoir Dogs. So he'll he'll give himself shit if he, if he wants to. Yeah, well, anyways... Let's get into our ranking of nine films. Wow. Quentin Tarantino's films. Again, we're combining Kill Bill Volumes 1 and 2 into the whole bloody affair, so that will count as one movie. So we have nine movies. Oof. And let's start at the bottom of the list. And there is no bad movie on this list. You know, worst to best. It's tough wording. You know? It's but the way it is. It's just, they're all great. We love all of these movies. I've seen all of these movies at least five times. I've seen some of them. 20 plus times. I feel bad ranking some of these so low on a list. Same. But then when you look at the ones above it, you're like, oh, I guess that's the way it has to be. So would you like to kick us off with the first film, Anthony? At number nine on Quentin Tarantino's movie ranking list, we have Jackie Brown, which is a really great movie. It's a great crime film. Excellent filmmaking. I love having Robert De Niro, De Niro in the Tarantino universe and filmmaking style. Uh, Sam Jackson dominates this movie in a lot of ways. Uh, Pam Greer is an excellent lead. Uh, the cast is uh, is amazing, and the filmmaking is really great. This is uh, based on an Elmore Leonard novel, who Tarantino is a big fan of, probably his favorite writer of novels, I think. Just like how Paul Thomas Anderson loves Thomas Pynchon novels, and his new film's based off another Pynchon novel. Uh, Elmore Leonard novels, it makes sense that Tarantino loves them because the dialogue is so uh, realistic and raw and naturalistic. And Tarantino writes like that, especially in his early films, of making it feel so conversational. It's not dialogue that feels plot heavy or plot required. It's just really people talking. And that's something that's always been so incredible about his writing. And as he got older and made more films, his his dialogue went from just super casual to blending into plot de plot dependent, but still feeling like it's real people talking and not people just trying to give exposition or people trying to get the f plot going. So. Jackie Brown is a great example of his only adaptation, but it's really great. And it's it's a fun film. I do think it's his weakest. That doesn't mean it's bad, but it just, in a way, it doesn't quite feel like a Tarantino movie like the others do. 
It does and it doesn't. It's interesting because after Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction is in 94 and Jackie Brown comes out in 1997, he could have done anything he wanted. Oh, yeah. You know, this movie still made $75 million at the box office. It was still a hit. And I think people were a little, not confused, but perplexed maybe by his decision to make this movie because it seems sort of small in scope. But it's really good still. I mean, Pam Greer plays a flight attendant who gets busted for smuggling drugs. Michael Keaton's in it. Samuel Jackson, like you said, De Niro. So the cast is awesome. A young Chris Tucker's in this movie as well. <laughs> he has a great trunk scene with – a great trunk shot, obviously, with uh, Samuel Jackson. But um, it's – like I, I put it on the bottom of my, on my list for Tarantino movies as well, not because I don't like it because yeah. I, I really do. I just think some elements, some elements of it for me don't completely work. I think De Niro's character – is sort of a wasted character for a little while. Not wasted, it's just he's sort of, I'm just waiting for him to do something for a while. Because it's Robert De Niro on screen. If it's anybody else, so you're like, all right, who's this character? But it's De Niro, and I'm waiting for De Niro to like do something really interesting on camera. It takes a little while for him to actually do something like that, his character. But that's just the script. The parking lot scene. Yeah, parking lot scene's great. And then the mall <laughs> scene, the parking lot scene, it's hysterical. It comes out of nowhere. It's like, holy crap. But I'm kind of like, oh, finally he got to do something. Yeah. So I think that De Niro's kind of just there. Just smoking to be, weed, just smoking weed with the with the handlebar mustache, just to be De Niro, and I. But I think Samuel Jackson is a, um, incredible in this movie. He's so goddamn good. He's the man. His his look, aesthetic, his aesthetic, and his character is just fantastic. But I, I think, and I think Pam Grier is also excellent. But for me, it is probably Tarantino's weakest movie. If you had to pick a bottom film for him, it's got to be Jackie Brown for me. This is one of Sam's best performances, though, with his with his accent, the lisp, and then the costume and hair. Is incredible. Ponytail. The ponytail. <laughs> He's played a villain in plenty in many movies, but he really is excels as a villain in Tarantino movies. So he's the villain in this, and then obviously he's the villain in uh, Django Unchained. One of the villains. He's he's really like one of the best actors working, one of the best actors of all time in Tarantino. Often plays him as either the antagonist and protagonist, and very few actors can pull that off. And Christoph Waltz is someone it worked as well, playing the antagonist of a film with Inglorious and then playing the protagonist, one of the protagonists in Django. So it, it's a testament to both their acting and then their collaboration with Tarantino where they can go both ways as different archetypes in storytelling and still pull it off really well. So this is definitely one of his best antagonist performances. All right, let's move on to number eight on our list. And we have... Sort of a double feature collaboration here with Robert Rodriguez, who made Planet Terror, and Tarantino made Death Proof, which you could argue is sort of a monster movie, horror movie in a lot of ways. So Death Proof stars Kurt Russell, who plays a stunt-driving serial killer who has a Death Proof vehicle that he kills women he picks up in. And it's a great concept for a movie. He got the idea from, who was he with in a car with? Was it, I can't remember the story. Sean Penn. Yeah. He was hanging out with Sean Penn because he knew the Pens, working with Chris Penn, obviously, in Reservoir Dogs. And Sean Penn was showing him, uh, he, they were talking about cars and Tarantino was talking about wanting to get a car, but he was worried about it getting damaged. Uh, and so Sean Penn goes, why don't you just have them death proof it? And, and Tarantino was like, what does that mean? Sean Penn was like, well, just give it to a crew of uh, car builders in Hollywood and they'll death proof your car so that when you're driving it dangerously, you don't really have to worry about dying. If you get in a car wreck, they'll make it completely death proof for you. That's how they build stunt cars. And then... That was a seed of an idea where immediately Tarantino said he's like, "Oh my God, that's like a that's a that's a character right there, and that's a car. What, how can I make a movie about that?" So Sean Penn gave him the first nugget of an idea for this. This movie's badass. I freaking love Death Proof, and Kurt Russell's amazing as stuntman Mike. But the rest of the cast is also exceptional. We have Zoe Bell, who is an incredible stunt woman and stunt actress. She was Beatrix Kiddo's stunt double, Uma Thurman's stunt double in all the Kill Bill films. As well as she's had major roles in Tarantino movies. She's in The Hateful Eight as an acting role. She's in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as an mm -hmm. acting role. She plays the the wardrobe costume designer on the film. What the fuck are you doing? What the fuck did you do to my car? My car! <laughs> but Zoe Bell's really, really terrific. And she does incredible stunt work on this, on the hood of that car. Really terrific stuff. Mary Elizabeth Weinstead. We have Rosario Dawson, Vanessa Furlato, Rose McGowan, as well as Eli Roth, Tracy Thomas, Marley Shannon, and Jordan Ladd are on this film. And the film follows, like, again, it's like a monster movie of the serial killer who just goes and finds girls. He picks up a girl in his car and murders them. And he does it by murdering them inside the front seat of his vehicle, which is not death proof. 
or he'll drive his death proof vehicle directly into a car full of women, which he does in the opening of the film. And then he's on the hunt, chasing and finding someone else to kill, which he obviously will talk. I don't want. Well, I mean, y'all. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Spoilers. It's a 2007 movie. Spoilers. Spoilers. It's about a guy who kills people with his car. It's it's honestly one of the best serial killer movies. It's I, it's up there. I mean, that's a bold statement. I think so. I, th- I think I think Death Proof is it's amazing. Maybe the most unique st- a serial killer movie I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, it's such a fun way to portray a serial killer, and it's just the whole concept of this double feature was to make it feel like it was made in the '70s as a B movie, and that's he captured that, you know, Grindhouse double yeah. feature. And it's really just like it's watching Tarantino. He's learned so much from making four films before this, and then he has all the money in the world. To work with, he can do anything. He's like, I'm just gonna make a, a gritty, raw B movie, B horror movie with my friends, and it's fantastic. And it does feel like a time machine. And and when Kurt Russell comes on screen, it's the whole movie just, oh my god, it's just fantastic. And eating those nachos, those messy nachos, it's one of the <laughs> best looking foods I've ever seen. He's just like those greasy nachos, and oh man, I love them. And Tarantino has a great reference. Who's what's this guy's name? Stop my mic. Stop my mic. <laughs> and I love the girls. That's they're all great characters. They're written really well. I love the conversations. Uh, and I like how we the first batch of girls we get to really know them. You know, we spend about twenty minutes with them, and we think they're going to be the leads. And then they then they get killed by him. And then we get the new batch of girls, and it's just really f- structured perfectly. Uh, there's some great music. There's some great sequences in the bars. I really enjoy this film. This is a great chill out movie to have a good time, um, shut your brain off kind of film, and it hits the genre perfectly. Like this is a genre movie, and one of his only, and it's just one. It's just really wonderful. Let's move on to our next man. I love it. Oh man, it's hard putting this so low because I, I love it. Hate putting this movie at number seven. I hate. I it. hate it too. I hate it so I much. I hate it because I freaking love it. I love the hateful eight, but we had to put it at number seven. Oh, that's tough. That's tough. I feel it, it bad. It really pisses me off, to it's be honest. It really grinds my gears. <laughs> I, I love The Hateful Eight. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't. <laughs> I, I'm canceling this episode right now. I don't want to rank these movies anymore. Oh, man. This is the first film he shot in large format, and then pro- and then it was projected in a lot of theaters in 70 millimeter. We saw it in 70 millimeter on oh, Christmas man. Day. It's Ooh, really back amazing. Back in 2015. Oh, my God. And like we said, his first film with Ennio Morricone actually making music for it. And my God, it's amazing. Ennio won an Oscar for the for the film. His first Oscar, even though he's so legendary in his career. Um, but the, the music's fantastic. It's actually one of my favorite modern-day themes. Really fantastic theme. The cinematography is outstanding. Robert, Robert Richardson, once he and Tarantino started working together, it was just they were made for each other as filmmakers. They really were. And this is one of his best works as well. Ironically, for being in such so, having so few locations. But really, what makes the film work is the, the script the cast and the in the cinematography and it's just absolutely unbelievable to see all these incredible actors under one roof uh, sharing the screen together and even when it's just a, what Tarantino does in this film is he'll 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 focus on two or three people at a time but you'll still see the other actors they're working in the background they're doing stuff and i like this movie especially for that reason because it's so detailed you can constantly see things happening around the screen on top of that the costume design the hair and makeup are phenomenal Kurt, Kurt Russell's mustache is to, like top tier. Getting <laughs> getting some of his favorite actors back again for this is just so fun to see. Uh, it's, it's just some of his regulars. And it's just a fun time. It's a great mystery. It's really like his only mystery movie. It kind of has... It's uh, a whodunit. Yeah, it's a whodunit, which is just a lot of fun. He's never really done that before. And so I like that that tone of it. And well, then, Reservoir Dogs is, is kind of a whodunit in yeah. terms of who's the rat. Yeah, exactly. But not quite a murder mystery whodunit. But you find out who's the rat halfway through that film, yeah. essentially. And I love the twist at the end. I love the cameo of Channing Tatum at the end. It's just a really wonderful film. I love, I love, love, love Walter Goggins in this movie. He's so good. And when he showed up, you're, it was like, this guy, he's perfect for Tarantino dialogue. He's so great. And that's why, obviously, he worked with him again in Django Unchained. Uh, I mean, Django Unchained before this. And it's just really phenomenal filmmaking, a, a stunning movie, and I adore the ending. I, I, it has one of my favorite endings of all time, and one of my, it's, it might be my favorite ending of a Tarantino movie, of them hanging her at the end, and just, it's done, and they all die. Nobody survives. It was just unbelievable. So fun. Wow, way to spoil it, Anthony. Just kidding. Spoilers! Spoiler warning, I'm sure you have gotten the memo, because we're talking about 
freaking Tarantino movies. Everyone seen who is that? <laughs> Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino. Quentin Quentin movies? Tarantino movies. I also think that The Hateful Eight has Samuel L. Jackson's best performance in his career. Mm. Major Marquise Warren is exceptional. He has so much dialogue in this movie, and I can't picture another director pulling off this movie the way that Tarantino did with all these characters and really one location. Mm-hmm. But also the filmmaking is so great. Not that other filmmakers can't do it, but just to to keep that tone of on the on the edge of horror, whodunit mystery, but then great comedy as well. But re- these really dark moments that are so entertaining, like the memories, the flashbacks, they're so intense. Mm-hmm. And this movie, especially the first time I saw it, it disturbed me at times. It irked me, but in good ways, like a movie should. And a movie makes you feel so many different emotions, but... This movie makes me feel all over the chart. I, I'm, I'm hyster- hysterically laughing. I'm intrigued. I'm disturbed. I'm perplexed. And it's got a great mystery. It really does. Mm-hmm. But the production design is stellar. And the wardrobe's excellent. Everything about this movie is just sensational. Just from a production standpoint, I think it's one of Tarantino's best-looking movies and best-made movies. It's really, really impressive filmmaking. And it's bold yeah. to make a movie with an opening of a two-minute shot of pulling out from a uh, crucified Jesus in a frozen wilderness in Wyoming during a blizzard with a, 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 a dust. carriage. <laughs> How many descriptors are we getting? It's just ba- it's just ballsy. Who, yeah. who does that? Yeah. And with haunting music playing in the background, mm-hmm. it's just so ominous. Yeah. This movie's just got ominous pouring from the clouds, and it's just it's just incredible. I freaking love The Hateful Eight. And I, that's why I hate putting it at number seven. Yeah. I really and, hate it. And it's just, it's wonderful having... Some of his early day regulars, Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, and Sam Jackson together. Tim Roth especially yeah. coming back because Madsen's got a lot of cameras yeah. in his movie. But yeah. Tim Roth, I don't think, had been in a Tarantino movie since Pulp Fiction. Since Pulp Fiction. Just the opening yeah. and then obviously the outro. And then he had a he had a, two deleted scenes in Once Upon a Time. But it, oh, like, Four Rooms, technically, he's in that. Yeah. But that's just a that short. That was like 1999, though, so yeah. it was still a long time. Yeah. And so just I think I, I agree. I think having Tim Roth... Back, like I, I remember smiling every time he was on screen because I was like, "It's Tim Roth in a Tarantino movie again." It was just wonderful. Jennifer Jason Lee is terrific in this yeah. movie as well. Daisy she's, Domergue, she's great. Daisy Domergue, and this is—I mean, this—he's so great at character names. This might be his great, his best list of character names. The honestly. Hangman gets you, you hang. hang. <laughs> I fucking love it. <laughs> All right, let's move on to number six on our list. We're gonna go with 2012 Tarantino's uh, one of his many westerns from this century. He's probably the the western the western yeah, director yeah. right now. He he, abs- he absolutely is. We have Django Unchained starring Jamie Foxx as well as Christoph Waltz and Samuel Jackson obviously, Kerry Washington and the great Leonardo DiCaprio, Don Johnson, Walter Goggins, <laughs> the, the Walton Goggins. The cast is absurd, but Django Unchained is exceptional. I think you're you're right. It's it's up there for visually Maybe his best looking movie it's is beautiful. It's it really is a terrific looking film. It's because it was his first western, and he put so much into it. I think. Ah, no, that's not his first western. Kill Bill, man, especially Kill Bill Volume Two is a western. Um, I'd say it has western vibes to it. Yeah, it's a western. But this, no, where's where where are the shootouts in Kill Bill? Where are the revolvers? He's, she's got a gun. Where are the revolvers? You don't need revolvers this, for a western. It's a western mix. This is a straight up western. Is what I'm saying. Okay, okay. This yeah. is like a oh, 100%. Straight, yeah. yeah straight I'm saying western. it's not his first Western. In mm-hmm. many ways, Kill Bill Volume 2 is a Western. I'm, I has West, it has Western tones. She gets buried alive in the desert. Yeah, it's it's it has Western vibes. It's also a fucking Kung Fu movie and a samurai movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a Western. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. But Django, Django Unchained, is a Western. Django Unchained is incredible. Christoph Waltz, you all know, plays a bounty hunter who's looking for... His next bounty, these, these targets, and the only people who know what they look like are is a slave who played by Jamie Foxx, Django, and uh, Christoph Waltz. What's his character's name? Dr. Fritz. Dr. Schultz. Schultz. Dr. King Schultz. Schultz. King Schultz. Rescues Django from his imprisonment of being a slave as well as the, the other slaves. It takes him on a journey to find these brothers who are his next bounty, but he doesn't know which plantation they're on. The Brittle Brothers. The Brittle Brothers until he meets Django. And Django knows what they look like, and so he takes him on a journey and and trains him up as a bounty hunter as well. It's a really unbelievable movie, and he won the Oscar for Best Screenplay for this film. It was his first solo Oscar win as a writer. Second? No, first solo win as a writer. Was that his first solo? Yeah. I thought he won for... Oh, let me double check. Keep talking. 
Uh, but hey, Django is – it's the kind of heroic outlaw western that stopped getting made in a lot of ways, especially at this scale. Working with these incredible – Fiction, you won an Oscar. Solo Oscar win. Oh, as a solo writer. Solo Oscar win. So as a writer <laughs> by himself yes. as he co-wrote. Yes. He had a co-writer with Pulp. Did you know that he wrote <laughs> Django by himself? <laughs> oh, my God. This guy. Um, and it's really an incredible performance by Jamie Foxx. I think it got underlooked as well as Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio's performance and Sam Jackson's performance. So Django Unchained, it had the best acting ensemble that year. And of many years this century. 100%. Because Sam and Leo, they could have both won for Best Supporting Actor, but neither got nominated. Django should have, I mean, Jamie should have gotten nominated for Best Lead, but because of the car character type, it's a stoic type, it doesn't get that much recognition. And they ended up pushing Christoph Waltz for Lead Actor for this. Even though I always feel like Django is the real lead, Jamie's the lead. It's called Django yeah. Unchained, yeah. But they, I think Christoph, he was coming up, the heat of Inglorious, and so they pushed him for Best Lead Actor, and he won his second Oscar for this film. But I do think that Sam Jackson and DiCaprio give better performances than Kristoff. I think that just the Academy would never recognize characters like that that they play, mm -hmm. even though they're both incredible in this movie. Yeah. Samuel Jackson is stellar This, in this is movie. my favorite Sam Jackson role. And then Leo DiCaprio's yeah. Calvin Candy... They're both incredible, but I think based off the kinds of characters they play, yeah. the, the Academy, I feel like they wouldn't want to nominate them for those roles because it might, you know, tarnish their reputation, I feel like. Same thing, like, they don't nominate people for comedic performances, or, or very often horror gets overlooked. It's when, This is a, one of the roles where when you look at DiCaprio's Oscar win for The Revenant, you're like, well, it's still not even close to Calvin Candy. Not even. Calvin Candy is, it could be his greatest performance as an actor. Calvin I think it's Candy. his most entertaining role yeah. ever. And he's just is so committed to that role. And, and the, Steven, the, played by Samuel Jackson, yeah. another incredibly despicable character. Yeah. They're both despicable characters that you just can't help but watch. You're, you're just watching two of the best ever on screen sharing scenes together. They're both their commitment to the physicality and, and the accents. And my God, like it, it's it's just unbelievable to behold. And combine that with the with the writing and the filmmaking, this movie is just it's definitely, in my opinion, one of his most entertaining and definitely one of his best written for sure. I adore Django Unchained because in being fans of Westerns, this is right up our alley. And I think he really did put so much into this, him and Robbie Richardson with the camera work and, and the filmmaking and shooting in these real locations and capturing the beautiful landscapes that we've seen before, but in new ways. Like one of my favorite shots in a Tarantino movie is the beautiful mountains with the sunset with them riding. And it's just absolutely stunning going to those those places. But then again, twisting fiction, historical fiction, and turning – a slave into the outlaw Western hero is just an unbelievable way to tell a story. And giving a, a slave the hero role, it's just so incredible to behold. Yeah, it's really unique. And I think that's why people love it is because it's just a juxtaposition of what we're used to. Because it hits so many beats of Westerns that we've seen in the past mm -hmm. and that we know and, you know, typical Western stories and elements. But it's also just a reinvigoration of that genre. It's a new twist. It's a new take. And it's just excellent. It's so fun. The soundtrack is so goddamn good. It's one of the best of his entire career. But Jamie Foxx is just an excellent leading man. He's so good as Django. And you can't... Everyone roots for Django in this movie. That's the thing. It's such a great protagonist. He's gone through so much. But he keeps that hero quality. He keeps that stoicism. And he keeps focused on his goals. As well as you can tell, he's just a very talented individual. The boy is a natural, you know what I mean? And you can't, and obviously, you hate many of the other characters along with Kristoff and Django's character and, and Jamie Foxx's characters in this movie, but it's so goddamn good. It's so funny as well. Great cameos. Jonah Hill is an awesome cameo in this movie. Joseph Gordon Levitt was supposed to be in this movie, but he was filming his movie Don John, so he couldn't be the role that Tarantino wrote specifically for him, which is unfortunate. I would have loved to see. A JGL cameo in this movie, mm -hmm. and who knows if his career might have changed a little bit after if he starred in another in a Tarantino movie. But even someone like Don Johnson being in this movie is absurd. It's just great actors, just kind of plucked from not thin air, but people you hadn't seen in his a while. His time was over in a way. Don Johnson hadn't seen that guy yeah. in anything in years. Yeah. And he's had a bit of a resurgence in his career, even though he was the man in the '80s and '90s. But he just kind of has just been MIA and been in Hollywood for a while. And also, Django is really the most heartfelt movie he's ever made with the love story between with Django and Brumhilda. 
and that love there. It's got the it's got good romance and it's got the sweetness to them that he had never you never seen in a Tarantino movie before. You saw a little bit with Beatrix when she was reunited with with BB. BB. But that was really I would have had BB. <laughs> that was really only for like uh, one scene at the end, uh, two scenes at the end. But this one, you get to see Tarantino playing with the romance, playing with love, and he did a great job. I think it was in combining it with his knack for magic realism that he does every once in a while with the the Broomhilda sequences and uh, really capturing the essence of true love on screen. It's something that he still. It's the only time he's really done that, and it worked really well. It's a really good point. It's a movie that has a lot of heart to it for a Tarantino movie. It does. Let's do one more, and then we'll take our intermission. Oh, yes. Oh, Kick yes. us off. Next up, we have, at number five, Tarantino's most recent film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, baby. Let's go. This is one of my favorite movies in living in L.A. I just love watching this film. Uh, it's one of your favorite movies in general? Living in L.A. It's, okay. Yeah, living in L.A. It's, it's one of the best Los Angeles movies by far. And like we said, capturing the time, building building that time and uh, creating Sunset Boulevard to duplicate what it looked like in 1969. I love, love, love the characters, the dialogue. And like many Tarantino films, there aren't really that many scenes or that many sequences. And the ones, in, they're long and they're incredible, like little shorts in their own right. And I love like the structure of the story. It's not really doesn't really have an antagonist there isn't really a plot there isn't really a goal it's more of capturing a snapshot of a life at this time with this these kinds of characters that Tarantino has always been fascinated with uh, I mean to open a movie at this day and age with a five minute cowboy western tv show like behind black the and scenes of it black and white like <laughs> are you kidding me who can do that it's amazing it's so much fun you get great cameos from from amazing actors, whether it be Al Pacino or, or Dakota Fanning, and I just really adore the film. I love Cliff Booth. I love Rick Dalton. Um, Austin Butler has a great uh, role in this film. It's just really a wonderful film. Margot Robbie is sensational. One of his better, one of his best soundtracks with a bunch of deep tracks. In I this think one. it might be his best soundtrack. It's, it really suits every scene perfectly. Um, I, I love. We get some more flashbacks. It's just. Tarantino just doing what he really loves and coming back to his roots of L.A. Some of his best needle drops for sure, but the soundtrack is enormous. There's maybe 30 songs on it because the whole movie, there's just kind of just music playing in the background because it's sort of it, – he captured a mood. He captured a vibe, an aesthetic of 1969 in Hollywood at the time. And this movie for me, every time I watch it, it gets better and better. And every time I watch it, I love it more and more. I'm at the point where – this last year in 2023, I watched it three times. We saw it at the New Beverly Cinema, Holly, oh, uh, yeah. Tarantino's Theater in Hollywood. We saw it there at a midnight screening, which was incredible, but also got over at 3:30. We were <laughs> rock dead, rock. Afterwards. I had to drive that night, so we wa that was an incredible experience to see that projected on film. We saw it on film when it came out mm -hmm. projection, and then I watched it maybe four or five months ago. I watched it one night just because I felt like watching it, and I watched it the next night <laughs> because I love this movie so so much. And the more and more I watch it, the more I, I adore it, the more I connect with it. And I have so much fun with it. And really, for me, it's the characters. It's 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 Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth. The, so insanely memorable. And just immediately in the echelon, the, the, the rogue gallery of Tarantino's characters, they are there. They are in the gallery forever. And it's like when I think about Tarantino, I mean, like Scorsese movies, I love to think about the all-time characters mm -hmm. in his filmography. You know, seeing Donnie from Wolf of Wall Street immediately entered that echelon. But yeah. for me, Cliff Booth, Rick Dalton, immediately top-tier characters in Tarantino's nine filmography of all of his movies. Their interaction, seeing Leo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt on screen together so much was just so enticing to see when the, you know, the posters started coming out, the announcement of the casting came out, the trailers came out. Just beyond excited to see it. And when you finally saw it happening, immediately pretty much, so soon into the movie, right when the movie starts, we got Brad and Leo on screen together. I was beyond happy. You know, I, I can't describe how exciting an experience that was to see them two together for pretty much the whole movie. <laughs> and how silly they are together, especially with Leo DiCaprio's performances. Rick Dalton is, is so goddamn funny. Most insecure man on screen ever. And, and then Brad Pitt as Cliff Booth, the ultimate badass stuntman. And just really honing in the Western elements in a more contemporary setting in the 1960s versus, you know, an outlaw time, whether it's the 1930s, early, I mean, early 20th century, late 19th century. 
I, I think it was just a great aesthetic for him to play with. And the music, the driving around, the characters. Like you said, there's really no plot. But you're just there with the characters. You just feel like one of them. You feel mm. like you're with Cliff Booth driving around. You feel like you're on a movie set with Rick and Cliff just hanging out before scenes get shot. But then the magic surrealism of we're with Rick behind the scenes of a studio, of a scene about to go on camera. And then he walks into the set and he's on camera. And we're, we're behind the lens of the movie or the show being shot. Line! And then we're behind that. And then we're like in the perception of the cinematographer or, or yeah. AD or director. And the camera spins back to its original spot, position, its first, its first position, redoing the scenes again. So it's just he's playing around with so many of the elements of movie making while making this movie. And so the, obviously this is a movie that celebrates filmmaking, but I think it goes a step further and it showcases Tarantino's deep love for Hollywood and his deep love for not just film, but the culture of fil the film, the culture behind film. Because we're not just seeing filmmaking, we're seeing what the lives are like with people involved in the industry, whether it be where they live, who they interact with, where they go out, where they go to bars. So I feel like this movie is a snapshot of probably the, the place and time where Tarantino probably would have thrived the most living because he was just a little kid and at this year. And so I think this is like a love letter to like, oh, I wish I grew up in the 60s in Hollywood. And I think he captured that. It's like it's like a celebration of not just movie making, but what it's like to be involved, to, to live in that world and the culture and community of that world. And then to incorporate his favorite theme of storytelling in the 20th century, 21st century of historical fiction, mm -hmm. taking a real life events that happened and doing his own twist on it. Yeah. The murders of Sharon Tate and, and the, the, what's his name? The, the killer, not technically the killer, the Charles Manson, Charles Manson yeah. and his family mm -hmm. killing Sharon Tate and her family and her friends. Yeah. So I, I thought it was really interesting. I really like how Charles Manson's barely in this movie. I, I think that was a, a, a strong decision for him in a writing standpoint, even though there's deleted scenes of him more in the film. Yeah, I mean, when they it was announced that the Manson family would be involved, I was like, oh, is Charles Manson going to be like one of the lead characters? And then you're right. It's just he it, I think it was best to not make him a lead. Yeah, the movie's about Rick yeah, and, and Cliff. And Cliff. Yeah. It's not about Sharon Tate. She's just in the background. She happens to be the next door neighbor. It's sort of the setting. It was I, for early days. It was being billed as like a Manson movie, kind of. I think that's what media was running yeah. as. And I don't think Tarantino yeah. was saying that, but that's what yeah. media. This is the headlines. He's because I remember Tarantino said he's like, oh yeah, Charles Manson is in it, but like he didn't say like it's about them. It's not about yeah. the Manson family murders. It's about Cliff Booth and, and Rick yeah. Dalton. Yeah, and it's it, he had to put him in because he wanted to put Spawn Ranch in there. Yeah, and so I think that that was like the connective tissue of it. It's about Hollywood in the 1960s yeah. of an aging star. Yeah, past his prime. That's what it is. Yeah, that's what the that's what people understand. It's not about the Manson family murders. It's about Rick Dalton, really. Yeah, he's the main character of the movie. Yeah, hundred percent. Absolutely, I fucking love this movie so <laughs> and so much. Yeah, and the costuming is just the best. It's but great. it sucks because this is number five. Number five. number five. Oh my and god! I freaking adore shame it. on us. I adore this movie. All right, let's head into our intermission though before we get in more upset about our ranking <laughs> because it's just pissing me off. This putting such great movies. Are you irked? I'm irked. He's irked everyone. I'm irked, but I would be more irked if you all don't sign up for our <laughs> Patreon, which gets you awesome bonuses and perks like access to ad-free episodes of our show. So you could be listening to the show without the ads. Then we need to pay our bills, but Patreon gives you access to it ad-free. For five bucks a month. Five bucks a month, you get ad-free episodes, every episode of the show, as well as awesome perks like private messages, watch parties, access to our Discord. All you got to do is go to patreon.com slash Raiders of Lost Podcast to take advantage of these incredible perks that we're offering you. Another great way to support our show is to leave five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. When we break 5,000 Apple ratings, I will be getting a tattoo of Anthony's Choice on my body. So just take that you into know, consideration. Into consideration. Please leave us to leave five us. star reviews. It doesn't have to be a written review. I'll take. We'll take ratings. So if we hit yeah. five thousand Apple ratings, I'll get a tattoo. I said on the. You air. gotta make some videos, man. I know. I keep forgetting. You gotta make some videos. I've been busy. Do some this week. I will. Another great way to support the show is to just share us with your family and friends. Word of mouth is the best way for a podcast to grow. So share our clips. Share our episodes. YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever. Just share us with your movie-loving family and friends. And this episode, like always, is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get our your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% off your order right now. They have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable. If you want to get some Tarantino movie posters, 
MoviePosters.com is the best place for it. They have all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for your poster needs. Our set in our home is decked out with dozens of these posters. High quality, super affordable prices. They are the best for your movie poster needs. They also do our bi-monthly movie poster giveaway contest. We just did a contest in our previous episode of best 80 best movies of the 1980s. We're going to do another one very soon. Congrats to that winner, which we selected today, actually. Whoever they are. Sorry, recording ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> but again, for all of your movie poster needs, go to movieposters.com and use our promo code Raiders10 right now to get 10% off your order today. Let's head on into our intermission, Anthony. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, here's my movie quote question. All right, here we go. Here we go. And here we go. That's not the quote. Let me just quote the late great Colonel Sanders. He said, I'm too drunk to taste this chicken. <laughs> uh, is it a Tarantino movie? No. <laughs> Say it again. Let me just quote the late, great Colonel Sanders. He said, I'm too drunk to taste this chicken. I don't know. Talladega Nights. Oh, I was going to say it's Tricky Bobby. Tricky Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> That's what came to mind. Why did I say it? Should have went with your gut. Should have went with my gut. There's so many obvious quotes from that movie, but yeah. that one's just kind of a, a, is an obscure one. It's a good one. <laughs> All right, here's mine. Every man dies. Not every man really lives. Oh, that's a great quote. It's a tough one, actually. Say it one more time. Every man dies. Hold on, let me try it with an accent. Every man dies. Not every man really lives. No, it's awful. It's a, it's a terrible accent. God. I feel like I know this, too. Um, every want, man want dies. A hint? But not every man truly lives. I don't know. Scottish accent. Is that the name of the movie? Uh, oh, it's Braveheart. Braveheart, yeah. Gotcha. Thanks. All right, guess Scottish this. Scottish accent is a great film. <laughs> <laughs> guess this movie release year. Shanghai Nights. 2004. 2007. Three. Three. Oh, damn. Wow, that's old. It is, right? And then Shang- I love Shanghai Noon. Me t- yeah. Shanghai Noon is awesome. And Shanghai Nights is great. Shanghai Nights is pretty good, yeah. Yeah. But Shanghai Noon, man, that's the stuff. Oh, yeah. That is a beautiful looking film. The cinematography is really great. Really wonderful. They should do another one. They should. I would I would be there. They absolutely should. What year did Braveheart come out? 1997. 95. Close, man. Close. Not good enough. <laughs> Not going to cut it. It's <laughs> a crappy way to say you got it wrong. Not good enough, man. You suck. <laughs> All right. This is a good trivia question. Better be. Pop quiz question. How many swords can you name from the Lord of the Rings films? How many swords? Swords. I can name zero swords. You can't name one. Wait, wait. Um, what's uh, what's uh, Bilbo's swords called? Sword called? That's the easy one. <laughs> it's um, you know, swordy. <laughs> Sting. 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 All right. What are they? Well, then we have Narsil, which is the sword. That was wielded by Elendil, who which shattered into pieces after he was defeated by Sauron. Careful with these names, man. You're going to get someone to unsubscribe. And then it was <laughs> reforged into Anduril, which was given to Aragorn, obviously. The Shards of Narsil, given to him, called Anduril. Then we have Glamdring, which is the sword that Gandalf uses, especially when he kills the Balrog at the end of the film. Sting. The Balrog? <laughs> 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 the Morgul blade is the dagger which is used by the witch king Ag- Angmar. I'm saying be careful with these names, man. You're and then gonna fuck them all up. Harrogrim, <laughs> which is King Theoden's sword. <laughs> you fucked all those names up. No, I didn't. I nailed them. Theoden? Theoden. Theoden. Fuck off. <laughs> That's the name of my sword after I fucking stab you with it. The fuck off, Anthony sword. <laughs> we have a quote from our fan Adam. Uh, let's see if you can get this. A man's ambition should never exceed his worth. A man's ambition should never exceed his worth. Great quote. Sounds very familiar, but I don't know. John Wick 4. Damn, I've only seen it 
I've seen it twice. Adam, you stumped James. Congratulations. Thanks for sending that in. You did. You stumped me, man. Stumped. All right, my next quiz question is, who directed Braveheart? Oh, it's Mel. All right. That's trick a, question. It's easy. You got it. I was trying to, I was trying to trick you there. Trick me how? Make you think, like, oh, did he direct it? It must have been another director. If he's, he if he's asking me the quiz. Of course he directed it. All, All right, right, we got a bunch of unsubscribes. Yeah, get into that because we have some great reviews that I got to read one. Up. So uh, Kenya Farragut wrote, did you guys say Wolfgang Peterson directed Amadeus? Nope, that would be Milos Forman. Unsubscribed. I, I messed that up. That was me. Sully Boy wrote on our 1980s episode, need the full list on Letterboxd, please. Still waiting on the most underrated list as well. Oh, that's not an unsubscribe. That's just a, <laughs> a screenshot of that so I can remember to make a list. Just a nice uh, comment. Just a nice nice comment. suggestion from Sully. <laughs> Next up, Kono Love on our Heat episode. Brian De Palma's Dracula. <laughs> Shame on you, unsubscribed. <laughs> Did you say that? Uh, maybe. It's possible. Is that Francis Ford Coppola? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible I said that. <laughs> like Brian De Palma's Dracula? <laughs> Ricky in our 80s episode. Unsubscribing because Alive wasn't in the 80s. <laughs> oh, shit. Did we say that? Did you say Alive? Yeah. We didn't put it on the list, but I think we said it. Next up, just another movie guy, 15, wrote, Guys, the Super Bowl performer is Usher. Unsubscribed. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it was boring as shit. I didn't, yeah, I didn't watch the halftime show. I heard show. it was super boring. Next up, we have Jimbro Braggins. Just wrote unsubscribed in your, in your uh, apartments.com ad. <laughs> Ron West wrote, Almost unsubscribed. Good recovery on Dalton Hutton, though. <laughs> Timothy Dalton Hutton. <laughs> oh, man, I was all over that one. Uh, Elysium Flower wrote, Your list and opinions don't perfectly align with mine. Unsubscribe. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> uh, Joe Jem wrote, Falcor is a luck dragon, not a dog. <laughs> well, he looks like a dog. Yeah, he looks I, know like a dog. I know he's a dragon. But luck like... dragon. I didn't know that. Luck dragon. Yeah, I guess he, yeah. A luck dragon. If I have, yeah, he, but he looked, I always thought of him as a dog. Tyler Lee wrote, Blade Runner is overrated, unsubscribed. Whoa. I wrote, how dare you? Jeffrey Jeffro wrote, I'm sure I could find many movies that I would put on the list you left out, but I always enjoy your show. But to put Field of Dreams and leave out Bull Durham, 99 times out of 100, I'm putting better, the better Kevin Costner baseball film, unsubscribed. Bull Durham is really good. It is really good. It's good. Blah, 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 blah. Leith Whale wrote, amazing episode, some of my favorite all-time movies in the 80s episode, but an, an 80s best movie list without Big Trouble in Little China, unsubscribed! Yeah. Almost put it in. Almost put it in. It's, yeah, almost made the list. Yeah. We actually, it's tough. We, we probably should have. It's tough to make yeah. that kind of list. Avery Covington wrote, damn, might just have to unsubscribe if I don't win this movie poster giveaway. JK, keep up the great work, guys. <laughs> Dan yeah. Dan Beachy, we just did our letterbox with him in his top four. I said it was uh, his top four had letter uh, uh, Fellowship of the Ring, but it was, it was he wrote it was Return of the King by the way, not Fellowship. Unsubscribe. <laughs> Thanks though, love the shout out. Anthony has trouble reading. Double shout out for Dan Beach back to back episodes. Not too shabby. Pretty good. Nice. That's it for our unsubscribes. All right, we have a great five star review on Apple Podcasts from Mommy Plus Eight. Their headline is new to podcasts. I'm new to the whole podcast thing, LOL. Never been to talk radio and viewed podcasts in the same category. However, I recently started watching True Detective Season 4, which, by the way, is freaking awesome. But I had no idea how long True Detective had been around. But it got me into wanting to listen to other podcasts and came across Raiders of the Lost podcast. And I gotta say, compared to some of the others, I'd much rather listen to these guys. Despite the F-bombs, LOL. <laughs> these two guys are quite the comic pa comical pair. And now I'm going back to their earlier podcast for 2023, and I'm enjoying such episodes like Godfather and Halloween. I am hoping you all will be doing an episode on this new season four of True Detective. I'm listening to podcasts through Apple, and so glad I came across this show. So glad you found us. So that's awesome. You must have found our True Detective episode. If not, we that's did one, one of our best. I think we did one on season one. That's yeah. one of my favorite episodes we've ever done. Yeah, I have not seen True Detective season four yet. I've been a bit busy, but I definitely want to watch it because it looks excellent. I've been hearing great reactions from everyone. I'm gonna wait until it's done and then binge it all. Yeah, it, it, it looks it looks awesome. I love the trailer yeah. and Jodie Foster is just we think one of the greatest actors to ever live ever. And to see her back in sort of a a great murder mystery role oh, as yeah. an investigator, yeah, kind of like how she. <laughs> It just give me this look. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. Um, obviously, she got so well known for Chloe Sterling, and I think that it's just great to see her in that kind of role again. So I cannot wait to see Jodie Foster. I'm sure she kills it. I'm sure she does. 
You're like, she's the killer? Or... <laughs> yeah, she kills it. So thank you so much for That's leaving a great that review. wonderful review. I Loved really it. appreciate it so much. And we're so, so glad you found the show. Yeah. I like that episode a lot. That's one of our best performing episodes on YouTube. It is. It was yeah. a banger, man. It's always it doing a lot well. Of, it was a lot of fun. All right, Anthony, what is your streaming recommendation for this episode? Max just added seven to watch it. I have a movie on Max as well. What? So we're about halfway through February now. Here we go with the story. Which means that <laughs> part two of an iconic piece of cinema is coming out very soon ah. on March 1st. <laughs> <laughs> so to get ready for it, I suggest you all watch Dune Part 1, which came out, it feels like, years ago. A thousand years ago. <laughs> Shut up. Just... So Dune Part 2 will release on March 1st. I recommend going on Max and watching Dune Part 1 right Can now. Can you go an episode without talking about Dune? Can you go an episode without being annoying? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's a funny it's one. It's relevant. <laughs> it is relevant, Anthony. You got the, you got the jokes, man. He's got the jokes. They have a hot press tour going on, dude. The Goodness. outfits they are crushing it. All their outfits and dresses are really hottest cast ever. I think it's a very hyped movie at the moment. People Everybody's looking great. I saw like they just did a premiere in England, and, and everyone has these incredible. Uh, contemporary fashion outfits and then Stellan Skarsgård with a black suit. <laughs> it's like he's like, I'm not dressing up in anything like that. <laughs> and Josh Brolin. Yeah, Brolin wears just a simple suit. He's a simple guy. Yep, very excited about it. Oh and God. and we just learned that based on the press tour, Anya Taylor Joy has some kind of role in the film. Some kind of role. Yeah, she's in. She's gonna be doing more red carpets with them. Exciting stuff. But let's get back into our episode on ranking Quentin Tarantino's episodes. We left off his movies. Quentin Tarantino's podcast episodes. <laughs> number nine was Jackie Brown. Number eight was Death Proof. Number seven was The Hateful Eight. Number six was Django Unchained. Number five was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And then number four, we're going to do Reservoir Dogs, the one that started all for him as a director. Came out in 1992 with an insane cast starring Harvey Keitel, Michael Madsen, Tim Roth, Steve Buscemi, Chris Penn, so many great performances in this movie, so many legendary characters, and just an incredible whodunit at the same time. A great mystery of a heist that takes place, nonlinear storytelling, a heist that we don't see the heist. We see the aftermath and we see the before. And we have an undercover cop played by Tim Roth in this film. And nonlinear story, storytelling is not new. It was not new in 1992, but Quentin Tarantino really made it insanely popular and turned into his bread and butter with this in 1994 with Pulp Fiction, sort of one of his main motifs for writing and filmmaking. And he used it insanely effectively with his movie, Reservoir Dogs, which again was shot in our neighborhood. It's so cool to check out the locations if you ever are in Highland Park. You did a great photo series of uh, the, all the scenes. Yeah, but Reservoir Dogs at the end of the day is just a cool movie. The soundtrack is awesome. The characters are excellent. They're insanely memorable. And what's so great about them is you really never fully learn all of their full names. Some of them are a mystery. Their backgrounds are a mystery, just like how the heist is supposed to be. And it's sort of like exists in the same world as Tarantino's movie Pulp Fiction, which is really fun. He sort of has his own little world, his own little bubble of movies that are connected, which is great. But I love Reservoir Dogs, everything about it. It was one of those movies that absolutely blew my hair back the first time I saw it. I've seen it probably 20 times. I can quote the hell out of it. I adore it. I love the characters. But I, I think what really makes it is that the stellar writing is the great strength of this movie. I feel like we were very lucky because we grew up in a time where blockbuster Hollywood was at a peak with the franchises of the 2000s. But I think we were very lucky where because of our older brothers, we were watching res movies like Reservoir Dogs when we were young. And I, I just remember whenever it was on, it was like, this is something different. You know what I mean? It was always like so cool, and it just, it, even the other movies, like even as a kid, we could tell like this was something special, and nothing else was quite like it. And then as you get older and you watch it over and over again, you realize how incredible it is from a filmmaking standpoint, from a writing standpoint, and from a conceptual standpoint. And this movie is just it it made Tarantino a, a big hit in the circles of Hollywood, but then it was Pulp Fiction that really broke him out in the world in a big way because that was so massively successful. 
with his wins, with his nominations, with the Cannes, the Cannes Awards, and then with the massive box office. And Reservoir Dogs made that happen. It was the catalyst for all of that. Reservoir Dogs wasn't that big of a box office gross, but it obviously grew to huge heights with rentals and, and, and VHS and DVD sales. And it became one of the coolest movies ever. And everyone, like so, so many people had Reservoir Dogs posters, especially in like guys' rooms or in college dorms, like Reservoir Dogs everywhere. And it was, it was a cool movie to, be, to like. And I feel lucky that we were watching this at such a young age because it, it showcased a different kind of cinema language that we didn't even understand was different. You know what I mean? It was just, it was normal for us because we would watch Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs when we were in our teens. Um, but it, we didn't really understand how that changed cinema and created like a new crime genre. To to put in the crime genre, this incredible style of writing and filmmaking, it was just unbelievable to behold. And it's still one of his best movies, one of the most rewatchable movies he's ever made. And it was a showcase of his talents with music as well. And it's a heist movie, and you don't see the heist. It's so bold. It's so daring. And this movie, it was really made because H Harvey Keitel. And Keitel loved the script, and he really, he's a producer on the film. And Tarantino often says, like, the movie wouldn't have worked if it wasn't for Har Harvey Keitel really coming in and helping to guide this project into fruition and really helping them get this done. So Harvey Keitel was a major aspect to this movie even working in the first place. Yeah, and I think it still has maybe some of Tarantino's best needle drops And ever. best lines. Yeah, some of the best lines, some of the best needle drops, some of the best soundtrack music in the background. I mean, just the opening, the opening track, My Little Green Bag, and then also Stuck in the Middle of You. Oh, yeah. With the torture dun, 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 scene. Dun, 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 Absolutely dun, dun. incredible. Absolutely incredible. And then we get the early magic realism that he started out with, with the stories... Especially with the, that, that story, um, what's it called? The style of the story, whatever the name is, and showing the different sequences of the story. And then Tim Roth telling it from the bare bones with the paper script in his hand to finally delivering it in front of the gangsters in the bar. That's one of my favorite sequences Tarantino has ever done ever, of all of his films. And then just the dialogue in Cars. The yeah. dialogue, the everyday dialogue that people mm -hmm. speak like and just... Really sensational writing, and, mm -hmm. and I, I freaking love Reservoir Dogs. It sucks even putting this at number four on this list. Honestly. I know, right? It's wild. Because at number three, is it your turn? Take it away, Aaron. No, it's your turn. Oh, it's my turn, yeah. yeah. At number three, we have Kill Bill, The Whole Bloody Affair. This is one of my favorite movies growing up as a kid, both films. Uh, and it's just a sensational, creative blend of genres. Incredible filmmaking, the first time that he was working with Robert Richardson, his his cinematographer. Incredible performance by um, Uma Thurman as Beatrix Kiddo, one of the greatest action characters ever on screen. Someone I grew up loving and thinking was just so cool and badass. An amazing cast of eclectic characters with phenomenal names, great costuming, incredible backstories and dialogue, and just some of the best action sequences still to this day, whether it be the Crazy 88 fight, the Vernita, Vernita Green fight, um, the Oren Ishii fight, uh, even the Bill fight for as small and short it is, it's just so impactful and interesting. And I love, I love, love, love the world that he created in this film. It's a world that doesn't exist but still feels real and blended a little bit of fantasy with samurai, with kung fu, with Chinese cinema. It's just a wonderful blend of filmmaking styles. And it really is Tarantino being his most creative, I think. Yeah, it seems like he had the most fun as a director making this movie. It's so entertaining, creative. I mean, I think creative is the best way to put it because of so many things he's doing, whether we ha we're blending genres, mashing them all together. We have kung fu. We've got some horror. We have westerns. We have samurai. And like you said, sort of creating his own world where someone can go on a plane with a samurai sword and it's fine. or there's, some The anime sequence. Yeah, and then blending in superhero elements or, or superhuman strength to parts of this film. But, you know, I, it's so interesting how different the first and second films are. The first film, I think, is a superior if you just look at them individually. Yeah. I love Kill Bill Volume 1. That's one of my all-time favorite movies. And I really, really love Kill Bill Volume 2. But I think there is uh, a bit of a superiority for Kill Bill 1 versus mm -hmm. Volume 2. Volume 2 is different because she's sort of done most of her big battles at this point. Really, she's just hunting down bill after dealing with bud and dealing with getting out of the grave exactly yeah. getting out of the grave and everything like that but i think that 
the the buried alive sequence mixed in with the flashback with uh with Pai Mei, really incredible. I love the Pai Mei sequences of training with Pai Mei from being, you know, a, a great martial artist and wanting to be this assassin at some point to getting broken down and turned into the ultimate killing machine, the greatest assassin on the planet, Beatrix Kiddo, and how that character was created. Because that's what I love about the second film is the first film, we see who Beatrix Kiddo is after she wakes up from a coma and how unstoppable she is and how great of a killing machine machine she is and how special she is. But how did she be created? What, what's her origin story to an extent? Volume 2 is origins? <laughs> Volume 2, Kill Bill, Beatrix Kiddo, origins! <laughs> how did she become the killer that she is? I love that. As well as seeing and what's Bill. motivating Bill, but also we see not only her training, but we also see her when she is a super assassin, and then in her biggest moment of vulnerability when she finds out she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. So so many parts of Beatrix Kiddo's story are told so well in part two that you're curious about when you're watching part one. So but they're very different movies, and I, I think that's why they work so well together. And then when you watch them as a double feature, because it's meant to just be one film, yeah. it would have been impossible to make this as one movie. I'm so glad he did it part one and part two. It would have been impossible to release a yeah. four hour, four, five hour movie. Yeah, but I, I think these movies together are just so incredible. The ultimate double feature because they're meant to be double featured. They're meant to be one. But, but you know, I think that it's just incredible storytelling. It's an epic. It really is one of the best epics ever put in cinema, I think, in the last, in this century. Yeah, it's just, it's a wonderful movie. And a great conclusion. Yeah. It's a wonderful conclusion. She gets reunited with her daughter that Baby. she didn't know existed until she shows up to f when she finds Bill. And Uma Thurman is Beatrix Kiddo. Just one of my all-time favorite characters ever. Yeah, I agreed. 100%. It's the best. Oh, man. I, I love gushing about Kill Bill, man. I really do. Yeah, right. too bad we already did the episodes on it. <laughs> <laughs> and we did a uh, yeah, Memories, Memories from, from memory. memory for Kill Bill Volume 1. How else can we milk it? Let's move on to number two on our list of Tarantino's best films. Top two. Oh, my God. I'm sure everyone's kind of guessing what the final two are, if they've been paying attention. But what is the order going to be? Number two on our list. Dun, dun, dun. From 2009, we have Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. What an incredible piece of filmmaking. What a picture. What starring a picture. Christoph Waltz, Brad Pitt, Eli Roth, Melanie Lorenz, and Diane Kruger, as well as Daniel Brühl. This film. Fastbender. And Michael Fassbender, of course, is astounding. Some of my favorite scenes ever are in this movie. Just the opening alone. How he didn't win an Oscar for Best Screenplay or Best Director is beyond me. I don't know. Because I think it might be his most well-made movie from an artistic standpoint, from a filmmaking standpoint. As well as some of the best music he's ever had in his movies. The characters are insanely memorable. And I love many of them. Aldo Rain is just an icon in Tarantino's filmography, as well as Hans Lando, one of the best villains we've seen in decades, even though he's very similar to Ray Fiennes' character in Steven Spielberg's film, uh, Schindler's List. But I think Kristoff did his own flair with it and his own eccentricities to it to make it stand out even more. It got an Oscar, obviously, for this movie. But this is stellar. This is Tarantino playing with historical fiction, Saying a movie, sort of Spielberg-esque, of killing Nazis. Killing Nazis. And I think it's incredible. World War Tarantino and World War II, this is one of the most hyped-up movies ever. You know, the trailers were incredible. And like usual, the trailers show a lot of action in Tarantino movies when there actually isn't that much action in this movie because it's just all stellar writing and stellar performances. And I think that Diane Kruger as, as Bridget von Hammersmark is just one of my favorite characters in Tarantino's filmography. And Diane Kruger demolishes the bar scene. She's, She's great. incredible. Fassbender, yeah. of course, as well. And then, and um, who's the guy who plays the the Nazi, the other Nazi in that guy? He's an that, Austrian actor. I can't remember his name. Um, August Deal. Yeah, he's really sensational as well. But Diane Kruger and, and Fassbender, specifically in that scene, which feels like it feels like a four hour scene, because I love being in that moment. I love being in that scene as an audience member. Her and Michael Fassbender are, are terrific in this movie. Absolutely terrific. But everyone delivers. Kristoff is sensational. He's so mesmerizing on screen. And Hans Landa, you hate him so much, but you can't help but love watching the character. Yeah. And it's just stellar filmmaking. I mean, you all love Inglourious Bastards, but I think production elements, exteriors, locations, the interiors, the wardrobe, production design is off the charts gorgeous in this movie. 
Okay, so I, so I love The Hurt Locker. I think The Hurt Locker is wonderful, fantastic, yeah, excellent film. That's what won Best Picture, Best Director, and Best yeah. Original Screenplay over yeah. in Glorious. You look back on it, it's a great movie. But it's not in Glorious Bastards. Not in, in, in a lot of ways, it's not even in the same ballpark, especially in terms of original screenplay. But this is an example of sometimes culturally, if a movie is the right kind of story... And the you know war in the Middle East was big. This is a more movie about that. Sometimes, what's in what's in vogue will get the attention, which is a you know it's it's a tough thing to say, but that's yeah. true. Yeah, that's what happened with the Hurt Locker. It's it's an amazing movie. I it love really it. Really is. It's one of my favorite war movies. Ever. But it's not in Glorious Bastards, and it's it's in Mark Ball, the writer. Winning over winning best original screenplay over Quentin Tarantino for Inglorious Bastards is honestly one of the biggest mistakes in the academy awards history in my opinion it's a great film but it's not in glorious bad the first should, scene should have won just for the first scene this might be one of the best written movies of all time ever in his history it could be then it could be like top five that's how good the writing is and it's really that opening scene and the bar scene there are that that is better those two scenes are better than the entire screenplay of the hurt locker in my opinion just those two scenes, and we're not even talking about the rest of *Inglorious Bastards*, which is phenomenal. So this is a case of what was hot at the moment. That's that's why Hurt Locker won all those awards. It's a great movie, but *Inglorious Bastards* is a masterwork, especially with the writing of it. It's Tarantino's best work as a writer, in my opinion. And that's it, it is really a shame that he didn't win. He did win with Django, and again, it's like you can't give Michael Jordan the MVP every year he plays. So I guess. Tarantino, every time he writes a screenplay, he could win the Oscar for best screenplay. I really should win. I mean, he he could he could have Oscar screenplays for uh, so Death. I mean, uh, Pulp Fiction, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Django Unchained, Hateful Eight, and Glorious Bastards in Pulp Fiction. He could have he could easily have six screenwriting Oscars. Um, I could totally see that hap like having happened. That's just not the way it's going to work out, and that's why Hurt Locker won so many awards over in Glorious Bastards. But time is told. Everybody looks back and. Everybody watches and adores and Glorious Bastards. And Hurt Locker, it's a winner, and people love it, but it's not even in the same ballpark as Inglorious. In Glor when we do our letterbox recaps and we go over everyone's four favorite fil films on their letterbox, our fans, Inglorious Bastards is pretty freaking common. Yeah. It's a it's a top ten on the list that we we hear regularly. And I know a lot of people really love it. And it's a lot of people's favorite Tarantino movie or a top Tarantino movie in, in many people's opinions because it, it deserves to be that. And we're talking about a, a career where Reservoir Dogs, Django Unchained, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Kill Bill, Pulp Fiction, and you're still putting a movie above all of those as yeah. the best in that filmmaker's career. It's a special movie. It really is. It, it really is a special movie. It's an all timer. And I mean, just look at that letterbox, Hurt Locker has uh, Inglorious has ten times more reviews and ratings than The Hurt Locker. Yeah, but I'm not gonna yeah. say like number yeah. of reviews means the movie's better or not. No, I'm just saying people love it more. Yeah, yeah. It's it's got five points over on a rating. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, three point seven versus four point three. Oh, if you said that, that would have yeah. been more relevant to what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, probably. Because I mean, Morbius probably has more reviews than Hurt Locker. That's, that's true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I love Hurt Locker, but Me too. In Inglorious Bastards, is, it's the cast, it's the characters, it's the writing, it's the setting. It's the comedy. The tone of it is just, there's nothing like it in cinema, what he did with Inglorious Bastards. And, man, it's also a movie about cinema, too. It's it's, it's like a, a cinema parody, so with, with, Nazis. World, with Nazis. <laughs> it's amazing. Kind of. Oh, my God. It's just, I love it. I love the music. And it's it might be my favorite Tarantino movie. It might be my favorite. It's a top three for me, probably. Yeah. I At love least, it. Yeah, it's probably fucking, top three. I fucking love it. And man, to get Brad in, in a Tarantino movie, I, I mean, we were freaking out. Yeah? Yeah. All right, Anthony. We got one left. We got one left. I'm sure you all know. I'm sure it's no surprise since he's only made nine movies. At number one on Tarantino movie ranking on Raiders Lost Podcast, we have Pulp Fiction. Really the one that broke him out in the world. Like I said earlier, extremely successful. So many awards. So much attention. Critical acclaim. Audience acclaim. One of the coolest movies ever made. I mean, there's just nothing like Pulp Fiction. He never even made a movie like Pulp Fiction again. It's that special of a movie. Yeah. And it's really, it's the characters he created. It's these sequences. 
And like movies like um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I think it's the closest thing to it in terms of structure where you don't have a bunch of scenes. You don't really have much of a plot, but it's really just a handful of sequences uh, and chapters. Obviously, these are chaptered um, that he puts puts in the film. And it's really some of the best writing he's ever done. Some of the be- might be one of the best screenplays ever written again. Um, the characters are so memorable, so iconic. The iconography of this movie in cinema history is just so powerful, whether it be Vincent and Jules or, or Uma Thurman. Um, there's just so much to it. You have some of the biggest stars in Hollywood as supporting roles. Bruce Willis in one of his best performances. I mean, there's so much to this film. It's one of my most watched movies. It's one of my most loved movies. Um, I remember just growing up as a teenager, we would watch this so much. And it's just, it's so special. There's nothing like it. And it's really Tarantino changed. He changed the the crime genre with Reservoir Dogs. And then he just changed movies with Pulp Fiction. Like there's only a handful of movies ever made that changed cinema. And this is with that, this is like a landmark movie of when this came out, nobody had ever seen anything like it before. And it changed the way people thought about movies. It changed the way filmmakers thought about making movies. Pulp Fiction is probably your one of your filmmakers' favorite movies, guaranteed. And I guarantee even the greatest filmmakers of contemporary times, I'm, I guarantee you they're like, yeah, Pulp Fiction, nothing ever happened like that. It was really that impactful of a film. And you can you, there really only are a handful of movies that had that much of an impact on understanding, like of changing the language of cinema and what a movie could be. It's interesting, if you look at our top two, Pulp Fiction and Glorious Bastards, they might be the most similar in terms of how he wrote them. Biggest difference, Pulp Fiction is nonlinear, and Glorious Bastards is mostly a trajectory, a straight line. But in terms of sort of chapters with a lot of an ensemble, like maybe four main characters that have their own sort of stories, mm-hmm. then their own little mini movies inside the movie, these two movies, Pulp Fiction and Glorious Bastards, are maybe the most similar in that respect, where there's like four characters that kind of have their own little plots that are all connected. Whereas, obviously, Pulp, I mean, Kill Bill is nonlinear. Reservoir Dogs not linear, but they have clear main characters. Pulp Fiction and Glorious Bastards is sort of like, who is the main character of this movie? Because it's f- four or five all connected together that all culminates in a connected climax. So I think that's really interesting that we have those as our number one and two. Yeah, you're right. It's a great point. And I I mean, in going back on like movies that changed cinema, I really put this up there. Like in other movies that did the same, you could say Citizen Kane, uh, Wizard of Oz, um, you could say Pulp Fiction. You could say The Dark Knight in terms of blockbuster filmmaking. Yeah, Dark Knight for sure. Maybe, maybe Fellowship of the Ring to an extent. Um, not I wouldn't say change cinema, um, and change the idea of a of a movie because big franchises, you know, it's it's not much different from indie or Star Wars. You know what I mean? Um, but th- these are movies that really like change the dynamic of writing. And change the dynamic of how you make movies in this particular genre, especially. Yeah, well, because everyone tried to make a yeah. Tarantino movie yeah, for years. Exactly. The Good and the Bad, the Ugly is one you can say really changing, like visual language and filmmaking language. How many movies in the 90s and early 2000s were trying to be Pulp Fiction? So many. Were trying to be Reservoir Dogs? So, there's like so many movies. So many movies. It's, it's, you can't even count them, honestly. Too many to count. But there's only one Tarantino. There really is only one. Yeah, I think Pulp Fiction is just so insanely good. And oh, 2001 is another one. Yeah. Change cinema. Pulp Fiction, the, the writing yeah. is just exceptional. The characters, the lines. And the filmmaking, even though it's amateur to an extent, he's a young filmmaker. Obviously, he has a small budget he's working with. It's still sophisticated as hell. Yeah, and you see the early tendencies he likes to do. But it's just he didn't have Robbie Richardson. Yeah, it was safe. Yeah. But also inventive filmmaking at the same time. Yeah, he did, he did a great steady cam shot in this. But also the editing, it's like he understands, like, to show Marcellus Wallace from behind so many times, and, to, and then we finally see his face in the second half of the film. Things like Motherfuck. that. Motherfucker. Motherfucker. There's just so many elements to it there. And then, like, using, when Butch gets into the taxi cab and using the rear projector background. Of a, of a film, stri- yeah. film reel from the 1940s yeah. or 50s. It's just amazing. Like, like, who cares? Who does that? Who, who does that? And gets away with it. Yeah. It still looks good. Because it you works. Accept it. It's because of the writing. That's proof that, you know... Insane CGI backgrounds, we don't need them. Mm-mm. This works fine. Yeah. It's a movie. We accept it. Because you're so immersed in it, and you're, you're invested in the character and the writing and, 
and it just it just works because you know you know when Jules and Vincent are driving in the opening you know they're really on a street driving obviously you can see everything yeah, in the yeah. background but then when Butch is in the taxi you know it's a static car they're just moving it up and down yeah and they're inside of a studio you know that but you accept it equally yeah and he did it deliberately because it's great writing yeah. great filmmaking mm-hmm. 100% I doesn't mean matter. I love it doesn't matter man we've done episodes on Pulp Fiction and I, that's one of my favorite episodes ever that we've same, done the Pulp same. Fiction one also I think it's the best thumbnail I've ever made in my life it's a great thumbnail it's pretty incredible. I spent like hours on that thing. <laughs> you spent three days on that. But that's a great episode. You were like, you came out of your room with a beard. <laughs> I'm finished. <laughs> I'm finished. When when do you do an episode and not make it there will be blood reference? <laughs> Good point. When do I live a day without making it there will be blood reference? True. All right. Well, that that is our Tarantino movie ranking. So number one, we have Pulp Fiction. Then we have Inglorious Bastards. Kill Bill. The Whole Bloody Affair. Reservoir Dogs, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Django Unchained, The Hateful Eight, Death Proof, and then Jackie Brown. Oh, yeah. That's a good list. list. Everyone is exceptional. I wonder where the movie critic will end up. I'm curious. I'm curious. I'm sure in five years this list will change again. But, man, I I freaking love Tarantino movies. I'm sure you all do, too. That's why we did this episode. I can't wait to uh, see his final film. All right, thanks everyone for tuning in. Don't forget to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of Lost Podcast. Leave those five-star ratings and reviews so that I will get a tattoo at 5,000 ratings on Apple Podcasts, which would be super fun by Anthony's Choice. And take care. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian Singleton, Tyler McFly, Andrew Hagen. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Raiders of the Lost podcast is a Mirror Image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson.